Well, I want to welcome everybody in the auditorium this morning, everybody listening online or watching to uh, back to our series, Walk Across the Room. And this entire series is really dear to my heart because I so many times talk to people that say, I struggle sharing my faith. Jeremy, I know that I should. I know that God, God calls me to, but I get nervous. I get insecure. I don't know what to say. I'm an introvert. I get tongue-tied. I don't like people. Whatever it is, you know, people you know, have all the reasons why they don't share their faith. And so this entire series is about learning to share our faith in a very natural way to where it's not something that you have to stress out about stress, you know, and so last week we kind of laid the foundation for the entire series. So if you did miss last week, you can go back online, wandatfamily.com, media, media, and there's going to be a lot of different ways you can click there to listen to it. And, but make sure you check it out because we laid the framework. Now today we're, we're going to kind of build off that framework because last week we talked about how Jesus left his throne in heaven and walked across the cosmos and entered our world, right? And we talked about how Jesus didn't come and to condemn the world, but he came to save it. That's what Jesus said. Right? Jesus said, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. And so the amazing thing is Jesus didn't get, didn't get his, you know, I talked about last week, his tunic or his robe up in a wedgie. You know, he didn't get uh, upset. He came and he entered our mess to offer hope. And we actually talked about the Samaritan woman and how the early Jewish readers probably were shocked at what, at what the, that John wrote about the interaction between them because they were probably expecting Jesus to answer many different ways, but to see that Jesus offered hope and relationship to the Samaritan woman. So you want to check out last week. Now today in the upcoming weeks, we're going to talk about 3D living. And we're going to talk about one specific D this morning, and then one D next week, and then one D for the final week. And we're going to talk about um, practically, okay, how do we walk across the room and share our faith? And when it comes to 3D living, um, how many of you have ever been to uh, any 3D, like IMAX movie or 3D? Yeah. I remember... I was seeing Lord of the Rings in high def 3D, which was awesome because when one person's head came flying across during one of the battles, the person next to me went, ah, and like fell down like this. I'm like, dude, like the head's not going to hit you. In the but uh, this past Christmas, we went to the IMAX in Dearborn at the Henry Ford, which, rest in peace, is no longer there. But um, anyways, it was a lot of fun because they had like these previews beforehand and they had these bubbles that were coming up and my daughters were so funny because they kept on going like this, like trying to like reach the bubbles and I'm like, what do you guys do? Like, it's so real, right? I could, I could, look, I could just touch it. And that, that's really, the reason why we call this 3D living is because that's what we're called to do with this world when it comes to Jesus Christ. We are called to make Jesus so real and so clear that people want to reach out and take a step closer to him. And so we're going to talk about that this, mor uh, this morning is the 3D living. Before we do, I want to pray because I mentioned this last week. If you have been a Christian for a long time, I'm challenging you to take what you've been thought and maybe even taught about sharing your faith and put it on the shelf just for a few weeks. You don't have to drop it. After the series is over, you can bring it back and put it right back in your, where it was before. But I just want you to be open and to, to look at sharing your faith in a different way. Than, and so I just want to pause real quick and pray and then we'll move forward. So God, thank you for allowing us to be here to grow and be stretched and to learn because this is something that's very dear to your heart, God, because you love people and that you love us and you want to use us to love people. So God, I pray that you would, God, open our hearts, open our ears. I pray that we would be challenged and we would be changed this morning by the truth of your word. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, really quick, pull out your cell phones. And the reason why I like doing text message surveys, if you just want to know why, is because it makes uh, it very anonymous to the questions I ask. So you can be honest. Because if I ask you this question one-on-one, -on -one, you might not be honest with me, all right? You just might kind of stretch it like this fish story, make it a little bit bigger. So why don't you answer this question and te th uh, to this number is, this past month, how many people would you think you shared your faith with? This past month. How many people would you say you shared your faith with outside people that don't know Christ, people that are not followers of Christ? And so go, it says, A, if, would you say 10 plus, B, 5 to 9, C, 1 to 4, or D, the goose egg? So just be honest. 
All right? We don't know any names. We don't know who's answering. But go ahead and keep that on the screen for a couple minutes. And we're going to go ahead and have you um, go, go back to the other number there. And then text the answers to that number as we move forward. See, because here's the reality. As a, as a Christ follower, we know that we are called to share our faith with others. We know that. But here's the thing. How do we do it? How do we do it? Because we know that in this day and age, it seems like more and more people are putting up walls to, to push God away. Right? More and more people are skeptical than ever before. As soon as you start talking about God or Jesus, the skepticism just rises. Right? More and more people, uh, it seems like the harder and harder we try to share our faith, the more and more sometimes people get pushed further and further away. And so I know, how do we do it? How do we share our faith in a, an effective way to where it actually produces fruit? Because that's the goal. You know, and if it's not a big enough challenge as it is, we face, as followers of Christ, this gravitational pull to focus inward. As soon as we cross the line to relationship with Jesus, there begins this gravitational pull to become inward. And so we begin to surround ourselves with people that we become comfortable with. But here's the thing. The more and more we surround ourselves with people that we're comfortable with, the more and more uncomfortable we become with those that are on the outside. So put it this way, we begin to act, this is, this is crazy, we begin to expect that people that don't know Jesus, we expect them to act like us while we act like people who don't know Jesus. I'm going to say it one more time, because that's really deep. We begin to expect people on the, who are not followers of Christ to act like us while we begin to act like those who don't know Jesus. We begin to uh, become disengaged with our culture, with those around us. Like I said last week, we become, instead of becoming engaged with those that don't know Jesus, we become en enraged at how they're acting. Like, how could they do that? I can't believe that they're saying that. I can't believe that they're doing this. I can't believe they're voting for that person. And we get all enraged instead of being engaged in people's lives. Wow. Instead of having compassion on people that don't know Jesus, we become critical of people who don't know Jesus. Instead of looking for ways to reach out, we simply become annoyed at how people are acting. And so this explains, though, why many Christians revert to picketing and pointing fingers at others. And this is why we have grown in America to be known as, you know, people that aren't necessarily friendly. You know, when people ask, what, what do you think of when you think of the word Christian? Many times the word becomes angry or hypocrite, right? Why is that? Because that, this is how we've responded in our culture. You know, how many times have you heard people say, oh, we're going to hell in a handbasket, right? I, I mean, I hear people say that all, all the time. Or people revert to, you know, um, I can't think of the word, apologetics. That's what the word I'm trying to think of. Apologetics. Because somehow we've convinced ourselves that if we can intellectually stump somebody, then certainly they're going to open up their hearts and give their lives to Jesus Christ, won't they? But we believe that, right? And so we practice our apologetics so we can become smarter and, and push people in a quarter and, and prove them that they're wrong. That, that's, that, that's what we want to do, right? And so we've, you know, people have reverted to bumper stickers and Facebook posts, and uh, yet they never like to talk to people in person. <laughs> so how do we share our faith in truly a fruitful way, a practical way? I'm going to go ahead and move on and skip that video. And so we showed a video last week that said, that showed you some funny ways that people shared their faith that are not appropriate. You know, we had the person who, do, who wears all the paraphernalia, but he said, I don't like people, but, you know, you know I just wear all the stuff. And so um, every single one of us as followers of Jesus Christ are called to make a difference in those that don't know him. We're called. Doesn't matter if we're introvert, doesn't matter if we're naturally gifted in it, doesn't matter if we're experienced in it. We are called to do that. We're called to partner. Here's the exciting thing. We're called to partner with God to change people's eternal destinies. Wow. He gets us, he lets us be in it. It's like kind of being a little kid who wants to help their dad change a light bulb. They can't even reach the light bulb, right? And they're like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll bring you along and just, you know, just for fun. And, and God gets to, he partners, we get to partner with God in reaching people. And you know, think about your friends that you love dearly, that you love to hang out with. Think about your neighbors. Think about your coworkers. Think about your family. All those people that don't know Jesus, God wants to use you to reach them. But here's the question. 
how do we do it? And so if you're not a follower of Christ yet this morning, then you can kind of just sit back and agree with me and say, finally somebody is saying this. And, but for those of you who are followers of Christ, I want you to tune in and, and uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is in the New Testament. The Bible has two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. And there is literally, the Bible has four Gospels, which is the works and the ministries of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke. So the third Gospel is Luke. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 1. And the verses will be on the screen. You can also download uh, for any device a, a, um, a free app called YouVersion. And we're going to talk about 3D living. This morning we're going to talk about developing friendships. That's the first D. If you're taking notes developing friendships. And we're going to talk about how Jesus, who was the master and most connected person to the Heavenly Father than anybody else who's walked the planet, is how he relationally reached people. And we're going to follow his example this morning. Now every week at One Not Family Church, we have a slogan, and I have you repeat it nice and loud. So if you can repeat this with me, say, if you open your heart, you open your heart, life, change will start. life change will start. And what I mean by that is if you will begin to open your heart to relationship and friendships, you're going to begin to see life change happen all around you. So the very thing that you want to happen in your friends and your family and your coworkers and your neighbors will happen if you begin to open your heart. If you open your heart, life change will start. Now Luke is an interesting gospel because Luke wasn't a disciple of Jesus. Matter of fact, he was a physician. He's also regarded as a historian. And this is really cool. The archaeologist Sir William Ramsey says that Luke is one of the most accurate historians that we've ever seen. I mean, his, his work and, his, and all the information that he puts in Luke is just accurate his, archae, archaeologically. I can never say that. That's a tongue twister. Archaeologically is accurate. And so it's exciting that when you read Luke that you can, you can know that, that it's very historically you know, accurate. And even though he wasn't a disciple, though, he, he got the stories. He knew the stories well and he wrote them down. And so we're going to look at Jesus and how he interacted with people who didn't know him. And how he responded to them and how he treated them and what he spoke to them. And so um, Luke chapter 19 verse 1. If you open your heart, life change will start. Jesus entered Jericho and, uh, and made his way through the town. Now there was a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Okay, stop. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> he was a chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to what? See over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Now I want to pause here for a moment because there's a principle and a reality that, that's very powerful here that we could miss and gloss over. Is that here is this tax collector who was not a good person. He was a thief. And we're, we're going to read a little bit verses, a, a couple of verses. He was a notorious sinner. I mean, if you have the nickname notorious sinner, that, that's, not, you, you know, that's not a good reputation. But here he is. What's he doing? He's going up, climbing a tree to get a glimpse of Jesus. Listen to this, guys. People are more open and spiritually hungry than you realize. So many times we see people's actions, we, we see their Facebook posts, and we assume that they don't care and they are so far from God that it's a miracle for them to be saved. But I'm telling you, people, God loves people. He's constantly working through his Holy Spirit to draw people to himself. People are more open to him and hungry than you realize. And here is Zacchaeus, this notorious sinner that's running to go get a glimpse of Jesus. And here's the amazing part of the story, is why couldn't he see? Because of the crowd. And sometimes church people can be the very thing that prohibit people from truly seeing Jesus. And that there's this world out there that needs desperately to see Jesus, and we need to not be the crowd that blocks them from seeing but if we open our heart, life change will start. So let's keep reading. Luke chapter 19, verse 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus! He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Now how cool is that? Here is where we get a glimpse of how Jesus operated in reaching those that didn't know Jesus. What did he say? Right? He could have said a lot of different things to Zacchaeus. 
He could have said, Zacchaeus, if you fell down from that tree and cracked your head and your blood spread all over the ground and you died, where would you go? <laughs> right? He could have said that. He could, if you were driving your camel, another camel came and knocked you over and you died, where would you go? Where would your eternity rest? Right? He could have asked those questions. But no. He simply said, hey Zacchaeus. He didn't say, hey sinner. Hey heathen. Hey person on the road to hell. Where, what are you doing on that tree? He said, hey Zacchaeus. Hey, come on. Come on down. I want to hang out with you. I want to go to your house. Wow. Wow. Could you imagine what went through Zacchaeus' mind? Like, he's speaking to me. I'm, I, I, if anybody doesn't deserve to hang out with Jesus, it's me. I cheat people of their taxes. I, I, I extort money. I put it in my pocket. I do all this stuff. And um, I take advantage of people. And here's Jesus. He wants to hang out with me? Wow. You know, I remember the, uh, when we first launched the church in September 2010, we were in Washington Elementary School and Vinewood here in Wyandotte, between 12th and 15th Street. And, you know, the cool thing about that is in order to open the building, we had to pay for custodians to be there. So there was custodians that had to be there in the proximity of church every single Sunday, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. But they, they had a little custodian room next to, to the gym, gymnasium. And so after everything kind of got ready and set, the custodian would you know, go to their room and kind of just hang out and chill until, this, until the gathering was over. Um, but what was cool is my dad began to talk to the custodian just about football. Right? Nothing spiritual, not talking about, you know, anything, but just started talking about football. This person loved football. And so they began to have conversation upon conversation about football week after week. And then several of us began to reach out and get to know the custodian and, you know, who they were, what their name was, what their interests were, just to get to know about them. Started to develop some friendship. And that's what Jesus did here in verse 5. He looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house. I want to, begin, I want to get to know you, Zacchaeus. And see, what would happen if we began to, as, as followers of Christ, began to become passionate about loving people and building relationships and getting to know people instead of just spitting out what we believe in our doctrine and our beliefs just so we can say we're doing something spiritual. Could you imagine the difference that could happen and, and we began to love people? And know what else happens in this passage? Look at verse 5. What did he say? He says, Zacchaeus. I think as Christians, guys, we so often group people. You know, those are those atheists. Well, of course, they're act those homosexuals. Look how they act. Oh, that's a, those are Democrats. Those are Republicans, right? And we start grouping everyone together. And you know what becomes easy? When you group someone together, you're going to automatically become easy to criticize them. But when you know someone by name, it becomes harder to become critical and it becomes easier to become compassionate. When you develop a friendship... And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I want to spend time with you. He didn't just say, oh, those tax collectors, they're no good. Right? And so I want to I I pause here for a moment. And if, and if I could challenge you during this, during this political season, if we could be a church that stops making posts that lumps everyone together, you would do the kingdom of God a great service. I'm telling you, you know, it does, I've seen posts that talk about uh, candidates and even presidents that, that, that have the word stupid and idiotic and different things. Do you know that's called slander? Do you know that's called gossip? Do you know that God's not honored by that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being very pastoral and very real today, but I love you, right? <laughs> Guys, that's not okay. How can we think that's okay and over here say, well, I'm voting for values. Well, what kind of values do you really have? Guys, let our faith permeate every area of our life. We are called not to just put everyone together. We're called to be compassionate and to build friendships with people that are different than us. You can have your own opinion. You can vote for everyone. Yeah, have, but have that in a dialogue with somebody. Don't just throw it on Facebook and, and build walls and, and have people begin to say, you know what, see those Christians? But whatever. See, Jesus did it differently. If you open your heart... Life change will start. And Jesus knew that. And so he simply began to engage Zacchaeus in friendship. He began to build a bridge instead of put up a, a wall. Because did you know the Holy Spirit operates the most over the bridges of relationships? Not necessarily our words or our Facebook posts, even though he can use those. He uses relationships. Wow. 
Luke chapter 19, verses 6 through 7. You guys still with me? Yeah. Awesome. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. Ha! He's gone to the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. And this is, this is such an irony because what you see is Zacchaeus responds and he's overwhelmed and excited. He's like, wow, I get to go hang out with Jesus. It would be like Tom Brady football fans walking down Detroit and seeing you going, hey, Todd, climb down from that tree. We're going to hockey town to hang out, right? And you'd be like, woo, Tom Brady, selfie, Psh, right? You know, you'd be, doing, you'd be super excited. And so Zacchaeus is super excited and he's going with Jesus. But what are the religious people doing? They're upset. So you have the person that's not supposed to be excited to see Jesus is excited and all the other people that are supposed to be excited about Jesus and about Jesus reaching people is getting, they're getting angry because that's a notorious sinner. And so you can see this, that, that it's such a gravitational pull that once you become a Christian, you become inward focused and you become, the temptation is to become religious. And they're thinking, wow, if he really was the son of God, then he would know what kind of person he's getting ready to hang out with. So, so that, can't be, that can't be the Son of God. But Jesus said, no, no. I had one person, I have one reason, one purpose that I came to seek and save that which is lost. I didn't come into the world to condemn it. I came to save it. I'm here. The healthy don't need a doctor. The sick people do. Jesus said, I come for those that are far from me. Not for those who think that they have it all together. Wow. 3D living. Living by developing relationships. What if we begin to do that? And we begin to just extend our circle of comfort and begin to leave our circle of comfort and begin to, at school, build friendships with people that don't know Jesus. What if we begin at your job, begin to, that coworker that everyone's annoyed with, you purposely begin to develop friendship with them. Like, get to know about the person. What, you know, who are they? What are their likes? What are their passions? What is their story? Find out and begin to develop. Can you imagine what God could do? And how many lives would be changed? You know, that story, so what began to happen at Washington Elementary School is all of a sudden, I noticed one day, I was preaching, and he was sitting in the back row. And instead of going back to his custodial, custodial office, now this custodian was sitting in the back row at the gymnasium at Washington Elementary School, listening to the message and just watching what was going on. And I was thought, well, God, how cool is that? That you used just some relationship and some friendship and, and invited him in. And we never even asked him to come sit in the gathering. You know, but... The Holy, we're just doing what we're called to do in loving people and the Holy Spirit is starting to draw and so he begins to come to the back row. If you open your heart, life change will start. We're called to take time to get to know people. But I'll keep reading Luke chapter 19 verses 6 through 7. And meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if you cheated people, uh, if I cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back how many times? Four. Four times as much. So now Zacchaeus goes from being greedy to being generous. Not only is he repenting of his sins and making restitution for what was wrong, now he's going, I'm going to go ahead and be even above and beyond generous. He's experienced this unmerited, lavish love of grace of Jesus Christ, and it's changed his life. And the Holy Spirit works that way through us as we build friendships with other people. Wow. It goes on to say, Salvation has come to this home today, Jesus said, for this man has showed himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So because Jesus built that relational bridge, salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus. And there are so many family members and friends and neighbors that need someone to build a relational bridge to them and begin to get to know them, begin to have opportunity to just love them. And you would be surprised at the doors that will automatically open without you having to go, five spiritual laws, bam, right in your face, right? <laughs> Woman's robe, boom, on the ground, you know? 
No, there's nothing wrong with the Romans Road, right? I, I've used that in sharing it. You need to know scripture to share because there's going to come a time when you're going to have to open your mouth and talk. But when you begin to build relationships and friendships, the doors just automatically begin to open. It's amazing. When you open your heart, life change will start. So when you begin to focus on relationship building, you will find more fruit begin to happen in sharing your faith. When you begin to focus on relationship building and friendship building, you'll see more opportunities